Our second speaker is Dr. Michael Furman, who is welcome to put in. Uh, our, his research has focused for a long time on immune mediated mechanisms um, of kidney disease and kidney olivarts. Um, he um, has examined molecular mechanisms that trigger complement activation and autoimmune disease, as well as aseptic injury. Uh, and basically, this work provides a mechanism by which uh, renal injury actually trigger the immune system and inflammation. And today, I think we're going to get more of a general overview. Is that correct? That is, that's exactly uh, right. <laughs> Excellent, which is what I need, uh, based on complement and the kidney. So thank you very much, Dr. Thanks. Thanks for the uh, nice and accurate introduction. So um, I came here in 2000 for a fellowship. So I've been here a long time. And although the projects have varied, this is kind of at the core of what we've done that entire time. So um, by necessity, this feels like it's going to be a superficial, just uh, skimming of the surface of uh, that work. But our, our interest has been over that time, the role of the complement system, part of the immune system in uh, various kidney diseases. So for those of you who ever studied complement and were tortured by it in medical school <laughs> immunology, <laughs> an old part of the immune system. It's sort of old phylogenetically and sort of old um, historically because it was <coughs> discovered in the 1800s. And the name complement comes from the fact that the first investigators observed that it sort of complements the function of the antibody. So when they did in vitro assays where antibodies destroyed bacteria, they knew there's something in the serum that mediates that destruction. Well, it complements antibodies, ergo the name. And this still informs a lot of people's view of this system. You've got an antibody binding a target, it engages this system, and this is a downstream mediator system of antibody uh, effects. Antibodies come first, complement comes second. Whatever antibodies bind, uh, um, complement mediates the destruction. So um, what I'm showing you, those who can't see, is a, an old diagram about 25 years old. It's a schema of what people believed was the pathophysiology of immune complex kidney disease. So again, you've got this 100-year history where people knew that complement mediates the, the downstream effects of antibodies. And it was pretty well recognized that many, many autoimmune kidney diseases, such as lupus nephritis, are characterized by immune complex deposition in the kidney. Well, it stands to reason that if immune complex is deposited in the kidney, then complement's going to be activated. It's going to mediate some of the downstream effects. And so people understood for a long time that complement is probably central to the pathophysiology of these autoimmune kidney diseases that we know have immune complex deposition in the kidney. So there's, there's this recognition that immune complex is deposited in the kidney. Diseases like lupus, we as nephologists routinely biopsy, and as part of the standard clinical evaluation to stain any biopsy tissue for complement deposits. And it's a really great biomarker. If you biopsy a patient with lupus and you don't see immune complexes or you don't see complement deposited in the kidney, that, that really makes you question the diagnosis because it's such an intrinsic part of those processes. So all kidney biopsies that we do are stained for about five different immune proteins and C3 or, or complement uh, deposition is one of them. This started really in the 1950s. So we've got decades of experience performing kidney biopsies and staining them for C3. So there's this, this pretty good body of knowledge about the role of complement in, again, immune complex diseases. But what we've discovered and what I can show you examples of when we get it up is that, you know, we don't only biopsy the, pa uh, the patients where we know the diagnosis. We biopsy patients where we don't know the diagnosis. And what was observed is that you actually see complement deposited in many, many kidney diseases where you don't have immune complexes deposited. So this led to this disconnect and it raised the question of, well, okay, we think this immune system is um, perfect time, great. Now, should I go into, this looks like slide here. Can I ask a question while this though? Yeah. So in, in whenever we see like um, antibody mediated glomerular injury, is that Sometimes complement plays a role and sometimes it doesn't, depending on the disease process. Yeah. Do we know why that happens? Or? So if you're talking about antibody-mediated yes. allograft or transplant injury, which is sort of a, a probably somewhat unique um, and interesting um, disease. That is not what I'm going to talk about, but I'll just mention it. So in that disease, antibodies bind to the endothelial cells, HLA or, or other antigens on the endothelial cells of the transplanted organ. 
So the body's immune system recognizes the organ as foreign, antibodies fine, and then lo and behold, complement is activated. And what has become part of the diagnostic criteria for antibody-mediated rejection is staining of the allograft of the transplant for complement proteins. And C4D, I think probably for historical reasons, you can stain for a bunch of things, but C4D is what is stained for. Now, what um, people have then observed is that, yes, it's no surprise when C4D is there, and people have said that's a good standard marker of this antibody-mediated process. But as you alluded to, people have then gone on to say, in some cases, you actually don't see C4D there. How can you have antibody binding to the allograft and not activate complement, which is a little bit different than what I was alluding to, which is complement activated without antibody, and then in this setting, you have antibody without complement. I don't know the perfect answer to that, but, but I'm not a transplant aficionado. We, we have one in the room and he could offer an opinion, but the <laughs> people have used the term accommodation to explain that. And I think that the point is that a graft that is under constant complement attack may develop um, defense mechanisms where it can hold it in check. And we see that in some native kidney diseases also. So, does it become unimportant? Um, people have actually proposed that it could actually be protective in some settings if the transplanted organ acquires the ability to control it. Um, I think that is related to the mechanisms I'm going to talk about, and I admit that I'm speaking a little bit out of my wheelhouse with that, but it is an interesting phenomenon and really gets to the heart of this issue of is this only an antibody effect or does it work independently and is it always, um, always there or not always there? Thank you. So we've got all these thousands, uh, yeah. Yeah, you mentioned um, that if you biopsy just different types of kidney diseases, you can still see complement deposition. I know it's not common that a healthy patient would get a kidney biopsy, but um, if you biopsy the healthy kidney, where, would there be still some complement staining there as well? Uh, so to your point exactly, it's always hard to get healthy controls for that kind of analysis. I would say for the most part, not. However, some of it does depend on the technique you use and the antibodies you use. So for example, we were talking about transplant antibody mediated rejection. When, when I look in mice, which I do a lot of, we always see some complement deposits in the demyeli. And I've heard transplant pathologists say that they always see some C4D in the demyeli. And so I think that there's a little bit of activation that always goes on. This is a bit of a digression, but what I think we see in the mice is that there's always the beginning of activation but the kidney actually holds it in check so it doesn't go very far. And I haven't looked at enough human tissue to know if the same thing happens, but based on what these transplant pathologists say, I suspect that that is the case, that there's always a little bit of engagement of the system and it just doesn't go the whole way. And one of the mechanisms that we've looked at over time is whether non-immune injury leads to complement activation. And what I think happens in that setting is you've got the system that is trying to activate itself and if you damage the tissue, then you sort of impair the regulation and then it can go the whole way. I don't really have any examples of that, but I think that that's, um, that's probably the case. So, so getting back to this dichotomy, here are examples of immune complex diseases. These are very kind of typical pictures. You've got this ball like um, group of capillaries, you've got deposits in it. We stain them for C3, which gets covalently fixed. It's a good marker of this process. And if you stay in a lupus, or this is just says immune complex MPGN or cryoglobulinemia, this is what you see. It is deposited in the capillaries of the glomerulus, pretty characteristic, and a pathologist sees this and, and knows it right away. But again, we've got all of this data saying, oh my gosh, in these diseases where you don't have immune complexes deposit, and this is an example I'll talk about more in a second, you sometimes see an awful lot of these deposits here. This is not what you would see in a, in a healthy individual by any means. So, it, it sort of um, raises questions about that simple paradigm of antibodies leading to complement. Could there be other things going on in the kidney that, that engage this system? And in fact, about 15 years ago, people coined this term for a new disease that they called imaginatively C3 glomerulopathy. C3 glomerulopathy simply refers to a patient with glomerular disease. We biopsy them. The pathologist sees complement. They don't see immune complexes. So something is activating the system that is not the typical immune complex lupus scenario. So this is a group of diseases that are more and more appreciated. We're studying it. It's pretty rare. It's considered an orphan disease, but of the primary kidney diseases, this is the one with the worst prognosis. 
So, um, so it's one of these things we probably just ignored it for a long time, and now we appreciate a little bit more what's going on. Now, this sounds very obscure, C3 glomyelopathy, that'll never be on your boards or your tests. Mm -hmm. But these principles probably apply to a lot of diseases. And this is a, an incomplete table I put together some years ago, where if you looked at all the preclinical and clinical studies, effectively any kidney disease you can think of has some evidence that this system is activated. And in my mind, that begs the question, and, and each disease is different, there are different mechanisms, but it begs the question, what is it about the kidney that is so susceptible to activation of the system? And I would argue it's a precarious environment where where if you've got ischemia, if you've got immune complexes, if you've got any number of different things that hit the kidney, it tips it over and you get this complement uh, activation. So there was something unique about the kidney. And, and that again is, is been the focus of our studies. So I've, I've offered what I wanna call kind of mimicking physics, a grand unified theory of complement in the kidney. And it's not gonna be succinct and I'm not gonna get through it all, but I'll try to kind of explain what I think is going on. I think that there is a unique feature of the glomerular basement membrane, and I will talk about this. It makes it very, very susceptible. And then you add on top of that some unique features of the kidney, such as the fact that it gets 20% of the cardiac output. And then actually, as it filters water, it concentrates all of the proteins in the blood into really the super physiologic concentration that it doesn't achieve anywhere else in the body. And I think sets up this surface to be prone to complement mediated attack. And I'll, I'll come back to that. Now, anytime you're talking about complement activation, you also have to talk about complement regulation because it's kind of the, the yin and the yang. You've got things like antibodies trying to activate it, and then you have these um, intrinsic proteins that are trying to regulate it and hold it in check. So anytime it gets shifted too far one way or the other, it's, it comes down to this balance of, of activators and regulatory proteins. And given how important it is to control the system in the body, the body expresses redundant multiple regulators to hold this system in check. Many of them are expressed, can you see my, um, once again, a technical problem here, I'll give myself a laser pointer. Um, you've got many of these on the surface of cell membranes. Um, these are cell surface expressed um, proteins. And then you have these soluble proteins primarily produced in the liver that float around just ready to hold the system in check. Because again, this is an immune system that has evolved presumably to fight bacteria and transplants perhaps, but not to attack the host, not to attack uh, yourself. And again, if it does attack yourself, then probably there's some um, impairment or inadequacy of these proteins. And this protein factor H is what uh, I'm gonna talk about because it seems to be very, very um, central to kidney disease. So here's the basic mechanism of activation in the absence of antibodies, or, or in some cases with antibodies. This system is spontaneously activated in plasma. It deposits a protein called C3 on nearby surfaces. It's a pretty interesting scenario where you've got a soluble plasma protein that is covalently fixed to nearby surfaces, which allows us to immunostain it. This deposited C3 has one of two fates. It is either controlled by these proteins where it's cleaved to smaller inactive fragments, or if it's not adequately controlled, then it's gonna self-amplify and generate more C3B. So you really have this constant balance of spontaneous activation that is trying to take off on a surface, and then these regulatory proteins that hold it in check. And what I would offer to you is, you don't even need that antibody. You don't even need that activator. All you need is the absence of regulation and the system is going to take off on, on a given surface. So the body has this 24 seven obligation to hold complement activation uh, in check for that reason. So the kidney is pretty well armed to control this process. These, this is some immunostaining we did something like 15 years ago in mouse kidney. You can see this protein is in tubules and glomerulus. This one is in glomeruli, this one is in glomeruli. You've got multiple redundant ways to control the system and hold the system in check stands to reason, right? We don't want the system to spontaneously take off. So everything should be good. And actually people have looked in human kidneys and seen similar patterns where you've got redundant regulation in the glomerulus, probably because it's a common site of attack of immune complex deposition and otherwise. And yet, even though all of these proteins are expressed, if you look closer in the glomerulus, there is part of it that has to still be unprotected. And that's the, the glomerular basement membrane. Here's a an uh, electron micrograph showing that this is a very thick 
basement membrane. It's acellular. There are no cells there, no cell surface regulators there. It's very exposed because the endothelium above it has large fenestrations in it. So plasma proteins come into the kidney, they get concentrated, and then the surface is very, very exposed. Well, if it can't express its own regulators, then it stands to reason that it's very, very dependent upon those soluble regulators that are, that are in the plasma. And factor H is the one that I'm gonna uh, talk about a little bit more. So this is a perhaps sort of a subsurface, a minor part uh, um, in terms of uh, area of the kidney, but it's pretty thick as basement membranes go. And I would argue probably completely dependent on soluble regulators. Uh, and then, well, I'll come back to this actually, the gags. So factor H appears to be the key. Factor H is a floating around complement alternative pathway regulator. It's a pretty large protein and it has multiple domains through this long string-like structure. And actually all of the regulation is done at this, this red portion, this one um, portion up the tip. And all of these other colored segments are binding regions. And the current understanding of this protein is that it floats around, but it can stick to host surfaces, binds there, and provides protection. The hope is that it actually doesn't stick to bacteria or pathogens, but there's very interesting science around pathogens acquiring the ability to bind factor H and cloak themselves from it. And, and there's sort of this uh, evolutionary arms race where perhaps complement has evolved to get around that and um, bacteria evolved to, to escape complement attack. In any event, this is a protein whose mission is to control the system and to control it only on your cells and your surfaces and not on bacteria. And these different locations are where it binds to the cell surfaces to protect them. So is this produced by the liver? So it's primarily produced by the liver, correct. So how do we know it's important? Well, this started with human studies. A lot of genetic studies showing mutations are associated with disease. People have made factor H knockout mice, and we've worked with these mice for years. And effectively, these are mice where the single gene for factor H is gone. They have everything else. And if you if you get rid of factor H and look in the kidneys, lo and behold, there is abundant, almost from birth, complement activation, C3 deposition. And I think you can appreciate these very bright green balls of glomeruli. And if you look by electron microscopy, this is very reminiscent of what human C3 glomerulopathy looks like. You've got the C3 deposited, you see the electron dense deposits. All you need to do is get rid of factor H and suddenly this surface of the body is vulnerable to spontaneous complement attack. And we've also done further studies where we made recombinant factor H, we labeled it with um, fluorescent probes, injected into mice, and hopefully this projects well enough. And you can see that this red is the protein that we put back in. If you inject it intravenously into mice, it goes to the glomeruli and coats those glomeruli. And it's kind of ratty looking, it's hard to see, but it actually, when we inject it, it, it starts to eliminate and destroy the, the complement deposits that are there as it, as it should do, it's a regulatory protein. So clearly this protein um, protects this surface from uh, complement attack. Now this is a plasma protein that presumably binds to every cell and membrane throughout the, uh, throughout the body. So still the question is why is the kidney so vulnerable or should I say is the kidney uniquely vulnerable? And this may not project well, but this was a study we did a couple of years ago where we took an antibody to C3 and we radio labeled it and we injected it into factor H knockout mice just to see what are all the locations in the body where the C3 is deposited. And what you can hopefully appreciate is there are two balls here where the kidney should be. And lo and behold, there was also um, a very bright signal in the liver. And I'm not gonna talk about it today, but it actually appears that if you get rid of factor H, that is the other location in the body where you get spontaneous uh, complement attack. And that was kind of a surprise um, um, in these mice. This is the thyroid, it's just um, free iodine that's taken up there. And then this is the bladder. Again, the free probe just filters through. So if you look through the whole animal, really what you're left with are the kidneys and the liver. So there's something about these organs, even though factor H works throughout the body, one would think there's something about these organs that makes them completely dependent on factor H. You take it away, the system, the system unleashes. It's kind of stating the same thing. So in um, some of the time I have left, I'm gonna talk about two of the mechanisms that we've looked at for that. And that is that we've tried to get at the question of, yes, these are homozygous knockout mice. The kidney is vulnerable if you get rid of it. 
Very few patients have homozygous deletions. A lot of patients have partial deletions or, or um, inactivating mutations, but how do they end up with the same phenotype if very few patients um, have an absolute deficiency? And I think one of the principles that others and us have really focused on is the fact that there are endogenous proteins that can block factor H, so that even if you are expressing some of it, these other proteins can then be expressed to sort of inhibit the inhibitor, if you will, and create an environment in the kidney where you have no um, functional complement protection. So you've got this, this soluble protein, we want it to stick to the GBM, but what if other things come along and block that from happening? And one of the groups of proteins that we have um, focused on um, are proteins called annexins, and I'll talk about that more. And then the other group of proteins that I'll mention briefly are called factor H related proteins. I always feel, I, I cringe when I have to talk about factor H related because I feel like you're already taking factor H, people are lost already, and then you start adding these, um, <laughs> these subdivisions of it. But these are very, very important for disease um, as some genetic studies have shown, and I'll explain what we think is the reason why. So these proteins block factor H, creating an environment that is deficient, kind of similar to if you, you had a true homozygous deletion, and then I would argue the GBM is the susceptible surface. So we started looking at annexins about um, 10 or 15 years ago. We did proteomics pull-down studies and found that if you isolate factor H, annexin comes with it. Now, annexins are known as these calcium channel or, or calcium um, dependent proteins that bind to cell membranes. And our first thought was <coughs> the cells express annexin, it binds to factor H, and that is a protective mechanism. But all of our data showed the exact opposite. All of our data shows that annexin binds factor H and keeps it from doing its job. So here, for example, are some flow cytometry experiments where we produce a recombinant annexin A2. We add it to cells, and these are graphs of the, the complement deposits on these uh, kidney tubular cells. And if we add annexin, it increases complement activation on the cells. So this is a, an intrinsic protein, and when you increase the level of it, it shifts the balance towards activation on the cell. Conversely, if we add additional factor H, we can reverse that process. So these two proteins appear to be directly in competition for controlling um, activation on the cell. A uh, similar experiment, we knocked it down um, with siRNA. And if you look at these graphs, you see that um, this is complement uh, activation on control cells. And if we get rid of an XNA2, it's shifted down. So this is a protein the body produces that seems to stack the balance towards activation on kidney surfaces, even if you have some factor H there. Uh, the other experiment that we did in vivo, and this is in mice, is that we produced what I would call atomic quantities of it and, and uh, pumped it into mice. And if you look in the kidneys of these mice, these are complement deposits. Here's a low power and a high power. These are wild type. We can actually see there's some spotty activation always but it just lights up all over the place. If you, if you go to super physiologic doses, you lead to um, kidney activation all throughout the, the um, of complement activation all throughout the kidneys. So this protein promotes activation um, predominantly in the kidneys and we think by blocking uh, factor H. So we've done some other um, molecular studies just to uh, tease apart this interaction. Here we made fragments of the protein and we made fragments of factor H and we just did various elisas to see what binds to what. And what we found is that this region of the nexin A2 binds to the 678 region of um, factor H, one of those binding regions that I showed you. What's sort of interesting is these other binding regions appear to be intact, but just by blocking that one, you seem to impair the interaction with the kidney, and then that's enough to let, uh, um, let everything take off. Now, there are some interesting studies, and this is just one paper from about 10 years ago looking at lupus nephritis, and the authors were not coming at it from the complement perspective, but what they observed is that an XNA2 is expressed in the glomerulus of patients with active lupus and not in those of patients with quiet lupus. We've had a little bit of trouble. Um, they, they stained other diseases and said this is very specific for lupus. That is not what we have found, but be that as it may, it appears to be a protein that for whatever reason is overproduced in some glomerular diseases, including lupus. And based on our work, you would argue that by itself is an activating factor and with or without antibodies is gonna to lead to an environment that favors complement activation. This is just to kind of point out that we 
part of my issue with that paper was that the antibodies they used were not as specific in our hands. We've made our own antibodies and these are just some flow graphs kind of showing the results. Here are cells um, in flow cytometry and when we use our antibodies, we can see that um, um, uh, Podocytes and other kidney cells express an XNA2 on the surface, and we now have very specific antibodies that don't recognize other renexins or other proteins. And now we've started to go back and stain some human biopsies. This is a lupus biopsy stained with our antibody. And I think you can see this circle, hopefully, which has um, an XN expressed within it. So indeed, there is some an XNA2 um, expressed in uh, lupus nephritis. And but we're working through the other diseases to see is it just some types of diseases or, or um, others too. I, I don't think it's um, only lupus though is uh, where we are. So now in the last few minutes, I'll just comment on these other class of proteins called the factor H related proteins. These are a group of proteins that really weren't really kind of recognized till about the last 20 years when people observed that mutations in factor H related proteins actually cause the same diseases that mutations in factor H cause. And people at first thought that these were other regulators, but the current understanding of them is that these are proteins that compete with factor H to help maintain uh, that balance. And if you look at the structure of them, they arose um, adjacent to factor H, probably through gene um, reduplication, and they contain the binding regions of factor H, but they don't contain the regulatory region. So the simple thought of these is that they, they can bind the same places, but they don't regulate so they basically just competitively block factor H from doing its job. Once again, you might say, shouldn't that happen all throughout the body? But it really appears to be only in the, uh, in the kidney. So we've done work where we made recombinant forms of these proteins, just kind of showing um, uh, the, we produced these in the lab. Then we tested them in vitro and in vitro. These are a bunch of results using the various um, FHR proteins, various uh, kidney cell types. We've used endothelial podocytes, um, sandal cells, and what you see is that indeed they do cause, they do promote complement activation as people um, thought that they would. But what's sort of interesting about them is that it seems to be FHR specific and cell specific, meaning one FHR does it on one cell type and another FHR does it on another cell type, which isn't really like that simple cartoon I showed you where they all have the same binding regions. It seems to be more specific than that. Nevertheless, they do seem to block factor H from binding kidney surfaces and they do seem to um, uh, be what people call dysregulators. They effectively make an environment that doesn't have factor H. These are some studies where we, we used um, recombinant factor H. We tagged it. You can see it in the glomerulus. You take this factor H related and stick it in. And without looking at the fine details here, you can just see that these are different, right? Factor H related B doesn't simply block factor H. It also binds in the tubular interstitium. It's in the glomerulus, but not quite as pretty as the factor H. So that there's, it's, it's incompletely understood. They seem to block it, but it's not on a one-to-one -one, um, ratio with the same ligand. And again, if you inject them all into mice and then look at what happens in the kidney, this one is very high, the others are all over the place. So they're not completely interchangeable. We don't really fully understand how this distinguish one from the other. So to develop reagents to explore this further, uh, Mike Kohlers and I have worked with Jen Matsuda at the um, Transgenic Corps at National Jewish. We have made a panel of knockout mice that are missing either all of these or individual FHRs. So we now have these mice and we hope that in the future this will allow us to kind of tease apart the role of these different uh, proteins on the specific kidney surfaces. And maybe what we'll find and what I think is that one FHR might predispose towards a disease that targets the protocytes and then another FHR might, might um, uh, lead to another location, but that's, that's still a work in progress. So what do we know thus far? I think that what we know is that the, the basement membrane, the glomerular basement membrane is uniquely and critically dependent on factor H. If you get rid of factor H, it's naked to complement attack because the other inhibitors just aren't expressed there. The liver sinusoids are, are probably similarly vulnerable, and that's something that um, um, I'll show another day. We think that dysregulators such as the annexins and the factor H-related proteins are endogenous blockers of factor H that seem to be particularly targeted to the kidney so that they can create an environment that is effectively um, devoid in uh, factor H. And that there may be other kidney-specific um, factors 
could also shift the balance even more in favor of activation, including the fact that you get very um, high concentrations of the activating substrate in the glomerular capillaries. Also pH and ammonia, which would be uniquely um, low pH and high ammonia in the kidney appear to be activators also. So you may have an environment that is biochemically in favor of activation um, for reasons that you just won't see elsewhere in the body. And again, kind of putting it together, what you have is that these, um, uh, this is a surface within the capillary, completely dependent on factor H, has, does not have its own regulators. Um, if you have things like the factor H related proteins or annexins, you effectively um, block it from functioning, the, the surface becomes vulnerable. And then similarly, the high concentration of activating substrate and then um, things like uh, the pH and ammonia um, even further favor activation in the kidney. So I will stop there. I'll thank some of the people in the lab and other collaborators here and, and around the world, and of course the, the funders. And if uh, there's time, I'm happy to um, answer any questions. Thanks. Josh, what about patients who had liver disease that results in liver functional impairment? Presumably they have lower levels of factor H. Do you know if there's any increase in complement activation in the kidney glomerulus of this? So, so it's an interesting question, and, it's and we've actually tried to look at that, and um, uh, I'll, maybe I'll cut into the chase, I'll tell you. We've looked at multiple proteins because the activating proteins are also produced in the liver. So you've got a decrease in the activators and a decrease in the regulator. Where is the balance? And so we've looked at the protein levels um, with some uh, cirrhosis samples and some, uh, we've been interested in hepatocellular carcinoma. It, it, um, complement proteins are clearly altered in liver disease, but it's not a simple, um, it's not a simple all in favor of activation or all opposed to activation. And so there appears to be some dysregulation, but it's it's not totally linear, but it's a, it's a good point. And people have tried to use liver transplant to correct some of these um, uh, defects, which is, as you can imagine, a pretty drastic um, thing to do. And yet, if, you, if your body does not make factor H, if you can get that transplant to take, you have corrected the problem. You have cured these otherwise incurable diseases. The challenge is getting a patient through the transplant because the liver itself depends on factor H. So you put an ischemic organ in and you need to get the patient to the point where that liver then starts to function. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Kind of along the same lines, but this factor H, I'm just fascinated by it, so I didn't know anything about it. But does it follow the same, like an, it's an acute phase reaction protein, like the sick, you get inflamed, so on, the factor H goes up by uh, export. Do we know the timeline in relation to acute events? You don't, know, it's a great question. And I bet that it is, it's made in order. The other complement, the activating proteins are acute phase reactants. We've done experiments years ago where we injected LPS and things like that. You see them spike very high. I bet H does the same. Part of the problem in answering that is that there's a wide range of normal, and um, it's like a in, in the blood, it's pretty high concentration from like 250 to 500 micrograms per ml. So there's a range of normal to begin with, right. and um, I'm not sure if people have, have methodically looked at that, but um, but I bet that you're correct. And so whether that leads to net activation or or inhibition probably depends on the ratio of factor H to the other activating proteins. We have done work, so in, in chronic kidney disease with reduced kidney function, some of the activating proteins go up and we've started to look at factor H and it does not go up. So we've tried to make the case that this shifts the balance. You've got increased activators without a concomitant increase in factor H, but it's hard to do because it's hard to precisely measure. And of course we need the right patients to look at, but it, it, I bet it is dynamic like that. Fascinating, thank you. Thank you very much.